God is good. Yes, he is. He is an awesome God. I'm going to talk to you today from Job. My brother, what he called a Jobologist. He knew Job from back to back, from front to back. And he loved Job, I think, because he related to Job on so many levels. And it took many years before I realized that we all have lived Job's story in one way or another. But I hope when you leave today, you understand Job and God just a little bit better. So we're going to read two sets of scriptures. Uh, we're going to start at Job 38. And Job 38 and 1 says, Then the Lord answered Job from a whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, and I'm going to add, or a woman. Because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Then we're going to skip over to Job 42. And we're going to start at 1. And Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom in such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things too wonderful for me. Some translations say things too wonderful for me to understand. And so I just want to talk to you for a minute about wonderful things. <coughs> so a lot of us know the story of Job. He was a righteous man. He, he sinned not. And uh, Satan came before God and said, hey, you have a hedge of protection on Job. <coughs> God says, no, you go on and test Job. Job is going to stay faithful to me. And I'm paraphrasing my, my own little translation. And so the first go round that God allows Job to be tested, Satan takes Job's family. He kills them. He kills all his livestock. He destroys his home. And Job's first response when he does all this is to worship. Job says, naked I came from the womb, and naked I will Amen. return to the womb, and blessed be the name of the Lord. And that was Job's very first response. Yeah. But then Satan comes back and says, he's going to eventually crack God. And God said, no, you can do anything you want, but spare his life. And so Satan afflicts Job with health. And here's Job's second response. See, the first time we go through things, that first go around of things, your car goes out or your rent's going to be late or, you know, your paycheck may be a little late or, I don't know, your husband gets on your nerves. We worship God. But let that happen. And then turn around and your dryer goes out. And then you go to work and they tell you don't have no job. Right. And then your husband still is acting a fool, or your wife is still acting a fool. And then your kids come home acting a fool. Job's second response wasn't quite as holy as his first response. Because he spends the next many, many chapters berating God. As time goes on, his worship turns to sadness. And then his sadness turns to anger. And before you know it, he's moving through the stages of grief. Well, what are the stages of grief? Well, first is denial. So Job tells his wife when his wife says, you should curse God and die. And Job tells his wife, should we accept the good from God and not from bad? Because I think he was in denial about how bad it was about to get. It's real easy to say we accept the bad from God when it's really not that bad. Amen. But let it be our loved one that we lose. And on top of the loved one, we lose the job and the car and the house and everything happens all at the same time. Should we accept the good from God and not the bad? Well, you're not in that place anymore. Now you're mad. Come on. And so the second stage of grief is anger. And Job says, I wish I was never born. I wish I wasn't even here. Death would be more peaceful than what I'm living right now. 
God has struck me down and I have the right to complain. Don't we feel like that sometimes that as bad as things get, we have the right to go to God and say, God, don't you see me? You see all these things I did for you? How dare you strike me with this affliction? Y'all don't get angry with God. I guess I'm the only one. I've been real, real big man. I'm going to say big man like the young folks say. I've been big man with God. Come on, I have done all these things for you, God. I have served faithfully for more than half of my life, God. I have served the choir. I have served as a minister, God. I've been faithful to my children. I have paid my bills. I have given what I didn't have. How dare you, God? I guess I'm the only one. And then he moves to the bargaining stage of grief. If I have sinned, God, how have I sinned against you? Just let me know so I can get it right. Y'all have a bargain with God? If I do so and so and such and such, will you please bless me? Job says, what have I done to deserve such punishment? Says God stores up the wicked, the punishment of the wicked. Let him repay the wicked. That's what Job says. Well, they did wrong. Repay them, not me. Let's make a deal, God. You repay them. They the ones that did wrong. And then Job moves on to depression. You formed me and you made me, but now you completely destroy me. How come the wicked prosper when I'm in distress? I miss the days when life was great. Anybody ever said that? I miss the days when life was great. I miss the days God was wonderful to me. I miss the days God was kind to me. I miss the days God took care of me. Because we tend to forget that if he took care of you then, he'll take care of you now. At that moment, I miss that day. I can't even focus on what you could do because I'm so caught up. What you did back then, why you can't do that again, God? I have done nothing to deserve this treatment, Job says. And here's the thing. Job was grieving because he had lost material things. He had lost family. He had lost possessions. He had lost respect. It said that he was a respected man. He was wise and people would come to him and they would ask him advice, but he had lost all of those things. How do we grieve? What do we grieve? Well, of course we grieve death. We grieve when we lose loved ones. Yeah. But it's so much bigger than that. We grieve when we get the cancer diagnosis. We grieve when we get the heart diagnosis. We grieve when we lose the job that was paying the bills, that we thank God for, that we bless God for. And now all of a sudden it's gone. We leave when our we grieve when our hearts are broken and he's walked away or she's walked away and your whole life was tied up in them and y'all were a we and not a I. And we grieve that. How do you go backwards from we to I? How do you go backwards? We grieve those unanswered prayers. You know, the ones that you've been praying for 10, 15, 20 years. God saved my family. God bless me financially. God make me a better money manager. God bless me with a spouse. God bless me with a mate. God bless me, bless me, bless me. Bless me with a baby. Bless me with a home. Whatever it is. And God has answered you not a word. And we grieve that. And we grieve when life doesn't look the way that we thought it would look at 16 and 17 and 20. Because, you know, you had those huge dreams. You were going to be somebody. You were going to be a great somebody. Mm -hmm. And you were going to get married and have 2.5 kids. And you were going to make six figures a year. And you were going to have this big house and this white picket fence. And you were going to travel the world. Yeah. And now you're traveling two miles downtown to have dinner because that's all you can afford to do. And your life looks nothing like you imagined it to look. Come on now. And we grieve that. But here's the thing. It won't always be like this. And we think about that in terms of it won't always be like this when it's bad. Well, it won't always be like this when it's good either. And that's where Job got stuck. It says Job thought about what his life was and he felt like because God had blessed him so mightily, it would always be good because God had blessed him all the time. So why would God stop blessing him now? He had always blessed him. And Job didn't realize the word said it rains on the just and the unjust. 
And so we have to appreciate the moments that it's good because it won't always be this way. There is encouragement to say it's not always going to be this bad. But when it's good, enjoy that good. I'm telling you, appreciate that moment. Hug your loved ones. Go to work and say, thank you, Jesus. I don't care if they're making you mad or not. I don't care if you like it or not. You better go to work and say, thank you, Lord. Because tomorrow on the job is not promised. When I get in the car every day, you know what I say? Thank you, Lord, that the car starts up. Because I've been in places where I got in the car and it didn't start. And $1,800, $1,900 later, here I am. So when I get in now and it starts up, thank you, Jesus. I appreciate that moment. Yeah. When I open my refrigerator and there's food in there, I know I look all good. It's been many days we didn't have no food at home. Thank you, Lord, for food at home. When I get a text from a friend, I know this doesn't seem like much, but when somebody texts me and say, have a great day, I appreciate that because there's been times in my life I felt so alone, I didn't know what to do. And so I appreciate having a friend that loves me enough to text me and say, good morning, how's your day going? We have to learn to appreciate those times. Yeah. Hereticus, which is a Greek philosopher, said the only constant is change. And so many times we fool ourselves into thinking that life is going to stay the same. But the only constant is change. Job said he was a friend of God. He was wealthy. He was healthy. And now he feels deserted and mocked and taunted and disrespected. Mm. And he just doesn't understand why. And here's the thing, you know, you gotta. I, I was told by children this: you gotta be careful about who you surround yourself with, because All most right, of Joe yes, yes, right. yes. is about his crazy friends. <laughs> and here's the thing: his friends really didn't mean any harm. Mm. The Bible says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. All right. Or the Bible don't say that. Somebody so said it. I don't know who said it. We but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we have these friends that have intentions for us. And, and in their mind, they're good intentions. They, they're doing good things for us. And in the, and Job's friends mind, hey, you must have done something wrong. You must have really made God big mad. That's why you're going through this. So I suggest you get it right with God. Go on and repent. And after a while, Job gets angry. And he's like, look, I didn't do anything wrong. I did nothing wrong. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? You make sure you agree with your friends. Your friends not telling you the right thing might not be the right friends. Amen. What Job realizes is that sometimes our pain is not punishment. Sometimes it's to purify and sometimes it's to promote. When you look through the Bible at Joseph and at David and at John, they went through very, very painful times. And all God was doing is building them up to get to the next phase of life. And a lot of times that's what our pain is doing. And we don't realize it at the time. So when the car doesn't start and you don't have the $2,000 to go put into your car, maybe that's God saying, I got a new car for you. Yeah. And I got to put you through this pain to get you to the next level. Maybe when you can't pay that rent and God makes miraculous ways, he's saying, maybe rent is not for you. Maybe I have a mortgage with your name on it and I got to get you from here to there. Maybe that horrible relationship that you're in is teaching you what you don't deserve so that when you get what you do deserve, you'll appreciate the gift that God gave you. Maybe it's for your promotion. Come on, come on. And so Job and his friends spend chapter 1 through 38. Yapping back and forth, <laughs> complaining and questioning God and assuming that they know what God is doing. And I can't say it over the pulpit, but you know what they say about assumptions, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so right about chapter 38, I guess God's like, look, these fools right here. And so then God speaks. And what he says is. Did you set the boundary of the water? Did you separate light from darkness? Were you there when I stored the hail and the snow and the clouds? Was it you who taught the lioness to hunt? See, I love this soliloquy of God because we realize how sarcastic God can be. And I speak fluent sarcasm, so this was right up my alley. Did you provide food for the raven? Was it you that 
caught the Leviathan by the nose up. That was you. You were there when I did that. Was it you that directs the movement of the stars and allows the seasons to change? Oh, that was you. That must have been you. Because you were asking me about me, so that must have been you that did all that. In other words, God says, I am the Lord. And what did I say? The only constant in is, is change. Is that what I said? Yeah. Amen. That's a lie. The only constant is the Lord. He said, because I change not. I am the Lord and I change not. So the only constant is God. In this whole thing, all we have is God. That's the only thing that stays yeah. the same. Okay. Yes, yes. So Joe, he, he tells Joe, I did all this and you weren't there. So who are you to question me? So you stand up and let me question you. And I always realized, I didn't realize until just now, until I started studying that he never really answered Job's question. Because Job kept saying, why, 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 why? Isn't that what we do? Why, God? Why, God? How come, God? When, God? How come, God? And God never answered Job's question. What he did say is, because I did all this, how can you not trust me? See, the whole thing was to get Job into a relationship. It says, uh, beginning of Job, it says that Job knew of God. But God knew that after this, Job would know God. Amen. How can we comprehend God if we can't even comprehend all that he's done in creation? Yeah. See, how can we comprehend what he can do in our lives if we can't even remember what he did in creation? Mm. So God challenged Job to trust him. Yeah. It's better to know God than to know the answers to your questions. Yeah. Come on, come on. He wanted Job to surpass the intellectual knowledge of him and have an intimate relationship with him. I'm so guilty of the intellectual, y'all. I'm I'm I don't say this to brag. People have told me I'm one of the smartest people they know. I'm really not that smart. I'm actually real blonde sometimes. And I'll be very honest about that. But I love Google and I love learning new things. And when I read the Bible, I love learning about God on an intellectual level. Because what happens in the Bible, those stories are very cool to me. But I don't always have an intimate relationship with God. So I can quote a scripture but that scripture becomes real to me when I have to live that scripture. Mm -hmm. When I have to live, greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. Then it becomes real to me. When I have to live, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. Then the scripture becomes real to me. Yeah. But I only get there when I have gone through some things to get there. Yeah. And so I can know of God a whole lot. I was raised to know of God. But it wasn't until I started going through some things in my life that I knew God for myself. I can't depend on my mom and my daddy. They raised me the way that they but now I know God for myself. So now I can say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because he showed me that all the things that I've gone through, I've done those things. So I can do those things. So Job finally moves to that last stage of grief. I know y'all thought I forgot there's five stages. That last stage is acceptance. And Job comes to acceptance. And what he says is, you ask me, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I did not understand. I spoke of things too wonderful for me to know. And Job finally accepts that with all he's been through, it's still too wonderful for him to know. And here's the thing. He says that before God restores his fortunes, before God restores his family, before God restores. How many can say it's wonderful before you even know any of that stuff? Mm -hmm. I found encouragement today in that no matter how the story ends, it's wonderful. Yes. Before we even know the end of the story, it's wonderful. So Job is restored after his acceptance of God's will. And he has a deeper faith and trust in God. And he has increased intimacy in God. And so I started thinking, y'all y'all know I'm a little throat sometimes. I love a different world. And so I'm going to call a witness today that's not in the Bible. Her name is Whitley Gilbert. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. And so Whitley 
gets married to Dwayne Wayne. For those that don't know, Different World, I I would suggest you go watch it. It's great 90s TV. And so Whitley gets married to Dwayne, and there's this episode that it's Whitley's birthday. And they've had a very difficult year. Whitley has lost her job. When they got married, they end up in L.A. during the L.A. riots. Their house has gotten broken into twice. She is wearing the same shirt every single day because she only got one shirt to wear, and it's ugly. It is a horribly ugly shirt. She got to wear the shirt every day. She got her degree in art history and, and gets this great job, and then she loses the job, and so now she's teaching in the hood. And if anybody knows Whitley, she is not a hood kind of girl. And so life has not been easy for Whitley. And so her birthday comes, and Dwayne decides he's going to throw her this surprise party. And she finds out about the surprise party. And so she tells her best friend, look, I know what he's, what he's planning, but this is really what I want. So you go and you make all these arrangements, and then I'm going to act like I don't know anything. <laughs> and so then Whitley says, what is my surprise face? So she says, because she's practicing. She already knows life is going to be great. She didn't plan this whole party, and it's going to be great. Well, Dwayne finds out that she has found out about this party. And he cancels the party. But he doesn't tell her he canceled the party. So he says, hey, you come on, let's go to dinner. I'm going to take you to dinner for your birthday. And uh, she gets all dressed up because she really thinks she's going to this party. She gets all dressed up. And they get to the place where she thinks the party is and there's nobody there. So she looks around and she turns around. She flips on the light and nobody's there. So she turns it off again. She flips it on again thinking they're going to show up. Nobody shows up. So now she's big mad at Dwayne. She's real mad at Dwayne. <laughs> so they go to this restaurant to eat and she's sitting there and he's trying to get her all excited about her birthday. And she says, Dwayne, where's my party? I know you had a party for me. Where is my party? I want my party, Dwayne. Y'all don't hear Joe in this? God, where's my party? I've had a hard year and I've lost everything, God. Where is my party? I deserve this party. And Dwayne looks at her and he says, who was there when you were going through all that stuff? Y'all don't hear God saying, Job, I know you went through this stuff. I watched you go through this stuff. But who do you think was there when you went through it? I saw you lose your family. I saw you lose your children. I saw you, your wife turn her back on you. I saw your friends act a fool. Who do you think was there with you? Yeah. And so Whitley stays big mad. And they go home and he had got her a bucket of chicken. She wanted shrimp, he got her a bucket of chicken. He tells her, you take that chicken in there and go put it in the refrigerator. So she goes in the kitchen. And she comes out, and there's her surprise party. <laughs> How does that tie into God? Well, he had a party all along yeah. for Job, and Job had no idea. And God said, Job, I just need you to be faithful because I was the one there. Just because you didn't get the party when you thought you were supposed to get the party, there is still a party, and it's too wonderful for you to understand. I just need you to hang in there with me, Job, because there are wonderful things ahead. Surprise! You don't even have to have no surprise face. God got a surprise with your name on it. So I just came to encourage somebody today. I don't know if you had your party already planned. I know I did. I'm good to plan my own party and plan my own life. And nothing ever goes the way that I think it should go. Amen. But I just want to encourage you today. If you will hang in there. There are wonderful things in store. When God went to the cross and he died, everybody thought the party was over. And God came out of the tomb and Jesus came out of the tomb and said, surprise, here I am. And he has not stopped. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So there is still surprise with your name on it. Because he lives, I can live, and I can have life, and not more abundantly. So surprise for me, there's one with my name on it somewhere. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what stage of grief you're in. And we're all probably in some stage of grief. But I promise you, if you will hang in there and get to acceptance 
And understand that the same God that created the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve and the mountains and the prairies and the sea is the same God. His power has not changed. And nothing that you are asking for is impossible for God. Absolutely nothing. All things are possible to him who believe. It's a surprise with your name on it. Something too wonderful for even you to understand right now. I just keep hearing that surprise. I'm leaving that with you. Surprise. And it's going to happen suddenly. And it's going to happen suddenly. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God. Thank you for the wonderful things that you have in store for us, God. Thank you that you never have changed, God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, God. And the promises of God are yes and amen. So we thank you for the yes, God. We thank you for the amen, God. Even when we don't see it, God, even when the lights are off and the room is empty, God, we know we're walking into a room of surprise, God. And it's not up to us to know the when or where or why, God. It's up to us to trust that you've already got a party planned with our name on it. And we just thank you, God, for the surprise, God. We thank you for the blessing, God. We thank you for the wonderful things that you are doing, God. We will stay encouraged, God. We will believe, God. We will trust you, God. And we will praise you, God, even when we can't see it, God. Forgive us for the times that we have spoken things too wonderful for us to understand, God. Forgive us for our anger, God, and our bitterness, God, and our unbelief, God. Help us in our unbelief, God. Help us to trust you, God. Help us to stand on your word, God. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, God. We'll be careful to give you the glory, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning at the Straightway Christian Church. We hope a word has been said or a song has been sung that has been a blessing.